But this is a course in mass spectrometry, so why don't we just get down to the business of calculating the mass of a molecule? We could do these problems with anything, but I kind of interested in larger compounds. So we're looking at a protein over here. It's actually a pretty small protein when it comes down to it. The structure corresponds to something called insulin. Well, actually, it's just the B chain of insulin. So you're looking at those sequences down there, which doesn't really give us much information other than the amino acids. Well, actually, it gives us all the information. It tells us exactly what the chemical structure of this compound is. That's what we need to know to determine the mass. So there's the formula and we have our periodic table. Now, obviously we're gonna use something that's got like a lot of decimal places. So let's just go ahead and calculate the molar mass of this compound. There you go. Looks something like this. Now, I'll tell you right away, this is like the worst mistake you can do when it comes to mass spectrometry. We're not dealing with moles. We're not dealing with averages anymore. We're dealing with distinct compounds, distinct isotopes. So in fact, this number here has absolutely no significance when it comes to mass spectrometry. And you remember this table that I've showed you before, you have to take those numbers, those periodic table masses, and just get rid of them. Don't ever use those numbers in a class like this. Good. So what do we do to calculate? Well, this is a shortcut. The nominal mass is simply taking integer values. So for carbon, we're dealing with 12, hydrogen is one, nitrogen 14, and so on. A rough calculation for the mass would come out to be just multiplying this through. Nothing complicated here, and you come up with a mass of 3492. So one thing you should notice right away is that these two values are substantially different from one another. We could plot them on a mass scale, so let's just sort of pretend this is a mass spectrum, and I'll just put the two numbers right over here. So you see that they're distinct from one another, but in fact, they're also distinct from the real pattern that we would observe. So you remember the ChemCalc formula that we could use? Well, you could calculate this theoretical isotope pattern. Now, the difference between the nominal mass and like the smallest mass that you see in those isotope patterns is quite large simply because this molecule is, ex is extremely big. So all of those sort of fractions of a number, they start to add up over time. Now, this does beg the question, what is the mass of this molecule? Because after all, there's like so many different isotopes to pick from. So which one are we using to calculate the mass? And yeah, it's, I guess, the obvious one. You're going to use the lowest mass. The lowest isotope we actually refer to as the monoisotopic mass. And by lowest, I'm not talking about the smallest intensity. I'm talking about the lowest molecular weight. Strictly speaking, the monoisotopic mass is the formula that comes from taking each of the elements in their most abundant form, which just happens to be the lowest masses from at least the ones that you see in this formula here. So we can go back to the table now, and I'll just highlight for you all of the masses that you should be using to calculate the monoisotopic mass of bovine insulin. And again, it's pretty obvious. What you're gonna do is simply multiply each of these masses by the number of atoms of each case, and then add them all together. So for all of you working at home, I know this is a simple place to make a mistake because all those numbers are being plugged into the calculator. So why don't you just go ahead and check your work you could go to an online calculator like ChemCalc over here and type the numbers in just like we do here and you'll get a mass. And they won't be the same. Okay, does that mean that I made a mistake? Well, let's take a closer look at it. When you look at these two numbers here, they're pretty close, right? I mean, that's how close they are. If you were to plot that on a relative scale, so just take the absolute difference divided by, it honestly doesn't matter which one you divide by, but I'll just Pick the one that I have, then you get a difference of about 44 parts per billion. Is that a big number? Is that a small number? I, I, it's hard to tell. Well, let's ask the question, can mass spectrometry actually measure things that are that small? You think? Well, yeah, they can. So this is a quite recent example of a group that uh, used a mass spectrometer called a pinning ion trap to record the mass of a single atom. And the atom that they were looking at was a single isotope of rhenium. Actually, they charged it up at plus 29, so the picture that you're seeing over there, most of the electrons would actually disappear. So here's the interesting thing. What they did is they excited one of the electrons, brought it from a ground state to an excited state. You know when you do that, that this atom will be in an excited state. In fact, that will increase the mass of the atom. And why is that? Well, remember our old friend over here who says that if you have extra energy, then you're going to have extra mass. It's going to be a very small fraction of mass, 
Well, actually we could just calculate it. So with about 200 electron volts, we see a mass increase of two times 10 to the minus seven atomic mass units. So we're trying to compare that mass against the mass of rhenium. And the authors actually presented this analogy. Let's just say that we have a scale over here and we're going to weigh an elephant. Okay, so you see the mass, something like uh, 6,000 kilograms, 6 million grams. Now, let's take an ant. And what you're gonna do is drop that ant on top of the elephant. Did you see the mass change? It wasn't by much. It changed by 10 milligrams out of 6 million grams. The increase as a fraction is actually two parts per billion. And yes, the authors were able to tell that difference. It's the same atom. It just has more energy, but in getting more energy, it has a slightly higher increase in mass. That's ridiculous. All right, let's go back to our mass spectrum of uh, insulin chain B. And we're asking the question now, what about the mass of that peak? So rather than looking at the monoisotopic peak, we're trying to find one of these isotopes, the M plus two isotope. Well, I guess you first have to figure out what is that isotope from? Well, of course you could take, for example, carbon 13 and you could take two of them, right? But it doesn't have to be carbon 13. You could easily get to that mass by adding two nitrogen 15s. Or you could take one of each, one carbon-13, one nitrogen-15. And in fact, you could use oxygen, sulfur, hydrogen. There's all kinds of different combinations. So when you're looking at the mass scale and you were to like zoom in on that isotope, if you could really zoom in, this is what you would see. Now notice the mass scale. It's just a tiny little fraction in the width. But you can see that there's actually all kinds of different isotopes that are all clustered together. The question is, do we actually even see this? And the answer is almost never. If you look at the masses between them, they're extremely close together. It's far more likely that all of these things are just gonna bump themselves together. So when we're drawing these spectra, we tend to just see them as one giant lump. Now I could ask the question, because we know that there's so many different ways to get to these different isotopes. What about that big one over there? Like which isotope combination makes that? Or other questions like, how about the smallest one or the, the biggest one on the list? Which isotopic combination comes up to give you those particular peaks? I'm not gonna answer that for you here, but I'll leave that as a question for you to think about. And just as a hint, you can use this table to sort out which these things might be. Now, the spectrum that we're showing over here is just what I would call a theoretical spectrum, okay? And now I'm saying, well, do we actually see that? Well. There's many different ways to answer that. The first way I'd think about is, it actually depends on the resolution. That's a concept that we visited last week. So if the resolution is lower, then you would see these peaks kind of blobbing out together. But that's not what I'm really talking about here. I think what's even more important is the fact that that scale is always M over Z. So we didn't even talk about charge. So we have to put on a charge. And I guess because the isotopes are spaced out by one, I do know that there's a plus one charge, so at least that's a given. If it was a plus two, it would be a completely different pattern. Well, not completely different, it would just be half of that and folded over. So if I just mentioned that mass spectrometers can measure mass differences down to two parts per billion, well, okay, that's an extreme case, but let's take a look at the mass of an electron, because in this case here, we've substituted electron mass, and this is the mass that that corresponds to, which is in fact, a kind of significant number, 15 parts per million, is in today's mass spectrometers almost a pretty routine measurement. So we have to account for that mass. At least we would if that molecule were ionized in such a fashion. But I'm telling you right now, the odds of using electron ionization or something of that sort to work with a compound that's this big, is it, it just wouldn't happen much more likely we would be using this type of ionization, so electrospray ionization, which is a completely different mechanism. Usually the process of electrospray ionization involves protonating the molecule. So whatever that mass is, it's actually increased by the mass of a proton. So let's just change the formula, right, to count for that extra hydrogen. And now we need to count for the extra mass, which is one, right? Oh no, God! No, God, please, no, 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 no! Just 
Don't make that mistake, please. Just don't make that mistake. We're going through all the trouble to get all of those decimal places. The mass of hydrogen is not one. That's the mass of hydrogen, 1.007825. Make sure that if you're going through the trouble of calculating masses to all this level of accuracy, you've got to account for the true mass of hydrogen. The proper mass that we should be recording should be this number over here. And of course, now the entire mass spectrum will shift up by not one, but about one. As well, the isotope pattern will change, but honestly, the addition of an extra deuterium or, or one more hydrogen to that mix, it's really not going to skew that pattern. You could, you could use ChemCalc to calculate the difference. You won't even be able to notice the pattern. You will notice the one mass shift for sure. Not one, 1.007825. Now, believe it or not, of all those relevant examples, none of them are actually what I'm talking about right now. When I say, is this the spectrum that we are observing? The question comes down to whether we are actually seeing the theoretical mass, the exact mass that we would predict. And the answer to that entirely depends on how good our mass spectrometer is. If we have a perfect mass spectrometer, we can hit the bullseye, we can find the true mass. But in reality, every mass spectrometer delivers error, some much more than others. So that's what we're gonna talk about in the next video because the higher the accuracy that we have, the better we can use that to be able to determine the formula for an unknown. All right, that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching.